guys after subscribing to this channel please make sure that you also press the bell icon so that no notification no new video of mine any educational video is missed by all right i'll welcome once again all the students uh, who are participating in the class tonight and uh, tonight will be oski part 1 there are so many questions which i have to discuss with you uh, i have a bank of couple of questions right now these are all questions which have been asked in your examination so i have a couple of those questions tonight and i'll be taking a larger class in the next uh, next week why because right now i'm like i said before i'm traveling so it's not very easy for me to give you a lot of time but um, i'll try to take up a bundle of questions tonight and uh, another bundle of questions the next coming uh, week and maybe if you get a little more more of those questions like some of you were uh, insistent on some questions regarding contraception some of them some of you wanted certain uh, questions regarding some uh, uh, query on pph some of them uh, wanted uh, something about uh, psm and statistics so um, if you give me those questions guys it will be very very good for me to you know um, you know make up answers for you and it will be discreet it will be more uh, you know uh, i would say it fruitful for everybody right uh, talking like this that ma'am some questions came on so how do i know which exact questions had come because whatever bank i had i'm discussing it with you most of them i've put it on the uh, on my oski list i have an oski bank uh, which is to prepare you for your final oskis in the examination it's a huge amount of uh, marks that is there thank you usha i love you so Uh, i have tried to prepare you for that some of the questions have been thrown in from there and uh, of course the other questions will be those questions which you will collect from your groups and uh, put it on the channel and i'll segregate them and make a make a list for you so let's start without wasting any further time this is a couple of um, question that i had which have come in your exam this is the kind of questions which are asked in oski and the marks are written over here <clears throat> now i don't know which exactly uh, which year which which exam but this is the kind of questions so everybody please be Uh, ready in your chat uh, chat room let's first discuss what you feel and then i'll give you the answer right so how many of you can describe the hysteroscopic findings in this picture how many of you can see see this picture is not very clear even i found it a little difficult to you know finally give an answer because i didn't want to give you any wrong answer so i had to like think a little and then Uh, you know this is the way probably they've designed the question they were un understood what exactly where they want to go so come on tell me everybody in the chat box or in the chat room what do you see in this picture describe the hysteroscopic finding in this picture and see it's just a one mark question so i know what examiner is looking to hear from you so you have to give me an answer and i'll tell you what did you miss right so i have an answer already prepared okay endometrium looks pale what else so pale endometrium points out towards what yeah it's adhesions can you see this place the ostial opening it itself has an adhesion over it's not a proper normal ostial opening it's got adhesions yes so i would say it's a scarred uterus okay it's looking like a scarred patchy you know the endometrium is not usually the look of a hysteroscopy in hysteroscopy of a proper normal uterus is a nice endometrium right pink fleshy endometrium it is not sparse patchy like this right so that is one correct yes it's got adhesions it's uh, having ostial adhesions can you see this is the ostia and it's got adhesions there as well which is very very characteristic of uh, tuberculosis yes correct and you have this uh, patchy pale endometrium agreed so we come to the conclusion of which is discussing i'll show you my slide as well right so this is in the favor of tb yes endometrial or uterine tb in which condition this type of finding is seen now comes the second question now you will write down tuberculous endometritis correct what can be its effect on her menstrual cycle all of us know it will cause what what is it going to cause yes very good scanty flow that's what the patients usually come with right it's hypomenorrhea oligomenorrhea right you will write down like this you will not write scanty flow you can say maybe the clinical features scanty flow and then bracket me you can write down oligomenorrhea hypomenorrhea sometimes even amenorrhea correct and uh, so this this specifically asked about menstrual cycle okay had they asked about uh, what history the patient is going to give you infertility would also have come right correct good all right very i'm so so happy with my students all my old students are answering on the there are a couple of new also who are, who are trying very very good excellent 
that's what i try to tell you keep answering write down the more you practice the more you will remember okay and doesn't matter you're right or wrong nobody's here to judge you even if you do answer wrong in my in my class i will just ignore it and talk about the people who asked the right one doesn't matter all right next uh name two specific investigations to confirm the diagnosis well here i've tried to give you a complete chart of all investigations which are very good for genital tb from a very authentic uh, new journal source and then i've marked the ones which are uh, specific to confirm this particular type of invest now remember this thing that when you're talking about yes tb pcr yes okay endometrial tissue for culture we usually don't give now all right i'll tell you what exactly are the ones uh specific if they want to know how do you diagnose you know how you how are you diagnosing right now how are you diagnosing right now you're diagnosing through a hysteroscopic finding correct and of course biopsy and then tb pcr can i can take that i can take what is the treatment for this condition that also i have tried to include a proper a tuberculosis uh, treatment genital uh, tuberculosis is managed almost the same way like uh, pulmonary tuberculosis is managed and that is what i have tried to include so very good very well answered none of you were wrong everybody was thinking the right thing i hope everybody can hear my voice and everybody can see the screen properly okay it is your likes is all right fine we can say that this is not so much not such a bad one it's not uh, uh the, those kind of additions in which you need to do a digitalizes here uh treatment will be uh the att treatment right it's all going to dissolve this is not such a bad bad case so this picture is showing the scarring of endometrium along with adhesions especially the periosteal adhesions that's what you're going to add over here i'll just add for you peri os tail adhesions osteal adhesions and uh, this is giving you a, a picture of tuberculous endometritis which is the diagnosis this is what is the symptoms of uh, menstrual symptoms that is what you're going to encounter and then this i have included the lab investigations and diagnostic modality for um this is genital tb all right so here you get diagnostic laparoscopy best diagnostic tool to detect this uh, genital tb by direct visualization and cages nodules you can take biopsy from here biopsy is very very important because that is going to tell you exactly the cages i hope you do remember this thing right chronic inflammation how do how do the cages nodules look what do they look inside the microscope and how the histopathology of this is uh, showing so this is going to tell you chronic inflammation most probably tuberculosis this is what is known right uh, any other chronic inflammation you know of uh, uh, genital tract it's not very common right and especially living in an india in india you got to this the first diagnosis that will strike your mind and of course you can confirm it with the tb pcr i'll accept that as an examiner i'm going to accept that so hysteroscopy is the second important diagnostic modality you can club them together take the biopsy and go for tb pcr that is going to help you in finally delineating the uh final diagnosis correct and this is the treatment i had to include don't worry you will get this uh, ppt everybody who was there in my updated theory course who's taken that you will take you'll get this um, entire ppt in that and you will uh, you can revise from there all right okay the the link is right there so anybody who's uh, there on the group and not uh, able to enter the chat room please feel free to uh, join in all right so the chat link has been put on my channel kindly everybody who is there in the class and not there in the chat room to converse with me it's very important that you uh, enter the chat room otherwise you'll not be able to write anything and the class will keep going on and you'll have no interaction with me right plus this, towards the end we'll take up a couple of uh, doubts so you can uh, you know address those doubts to me by writing it down in the chat box all right so this was the management this is the treatment like i said over here treatment of uh, the genital tract tb very similar to the pulmonary tb all right given for a total of 6 months you have an initiation phase you have a continuation phase see these drugs rifampicin isoniazid pyrazinamide ethambutol they are given for first two months of intensive phase and then comes the continuation phase so here now you have a three drug regime 
okay and like the two drugs that were given past remember so may, i don't know how many of you have um, tried to recapitulate or how many of you have studied those two dr drug regime in the continuation phase now you give three drugs all right so now you have uh, rifampicin isoniazid and uh, ethambutol for the next four months and the dosage and everything is included in this one table and this is a very very authentic table right from the who and uh, ntep program so there is no confusion remember guys whenever i put anything on my notes or if i put anything in the ppt i always put up the most recent and the most authentic one remember that so if you're writing or learning anything from my notes or from my ppt remember that it's already heavily researched so you do not have to uh, again go and uh, look forward to it don't waste your time right and anything latest that is going to come up i usually go back to my notes and i delete the old one, old ones and put the new one and the a notification goes to all of you okay so do not worry about this at all otherwise i usually skip it i don't uh, write down anything and i told tell you very honestly that this thing i'll be able to give you in the next class or i'll be able to or will provide you on the channel or something like that which is why it comes to my my old point that i was trying to tell you if you can give me your doubts or your questions uh maybe couple you know beforehand then my class then i'll be able to give you properly researched answers rather than giving you one liners uh you know during doubt solving so this is my my request to all of you so well this is the first oski question over if you've got any doubts regarding it you can write them down we can discuss it towards the end just remember that this was the first station correct and now i go to the station number 2 okay how many of you can identify the specimen and how many of you understand with surgery it is okay do not fear okay do not fear just whatever comes into your mind first is usually the correct answer so just write down whatever you feel right again uh, lots of students i can see joining in i'm very very happy uh please join in everybody who's there on the group who is not inside the chat room please write down just enter through that chat uh, portal that has been told given to you right now and uh, you'll be able to communicate with me right that's right that's right very good what do you, what do you think is the specimen what does it look like see now let me tell you this trick about oski all right sometimes you might be wrong sometimes what you're thinking might not be correct right very simple thing is to just describe what you're seeing what you're seeing right now is a specimen of a uterus with the cervix probably a vaginal cuff along with it and and it's got irregular bilateral masses most probably ovarian in origin which have rugged outside uh, irregular borders query papillary projections solid areas query cystic areas just listen to what i'm saying all right i'll repeat it again query cystic areas most probably ovarian carcinoma okay most probably that caov very good very good excellent so again this is a specimen of a uterus with cervix query with some part of vaginal vault with bilateral adenexal masses now i don't know whether we'll call it is it right to call this right more than left okay with irregular ragged jagged borders query papillary projections query solid plus cystic areas in the favor of ca ovary all right what do you think is this guys this thing which they have shown over here what do you think is this so whenever you do the ovarian carcinoma surgery you always do this part as well what is this yes very good in you know initially when i saw this picture i was like the picture so you know this this doesn't look like omentum okay it is looking something else but then when i saw that what questions they was if they give you a hint right so yes all of you have written it you are all right this is a tah plus bso plus a mentectomy sample and this you know adds on to our confidence level that this is if this is omentum which is more, most probably is see earlier it was looking like a that morselated fibroid right that is how it is so long but it was not looking omentum is usually like a curtain you know that long it's not like this but it's okay 
uh, now we do understand that why you take out the specimen, you know, it usually contracts. And that's how it's uh, looking over here, probably. So anyways, this is momentum because usually when there is a CA ovary involved, you have you go for a TH, you go for a BSO, you go for a radical hysterectomy, actually. You even go for a part of, uh, you know, vaginal vault. You go for a lymph lymphadenectomy, but you also go for biopsies from all peritoneal deposits that you can see and pelvic deposits that you can see. And you go for omentectomy, which is very, very important, which they want to hear, which is why they've given you this, this uh, particular look. All right. Name two tumor markers for this pathology, which is very evident in this picture. What will you answer, guys? So up till now, you were right. Ne now let's hear this thing. Name two tumor markers. Ev one, everybody knows one. Okay, the second one I want to hear. Which one do you want to give? Okay, some are saying CA, some are saying AFP. What else? What else? What else? What else? Something specific for carcinoma, something which is also utilized in some other tests, right? I don't know how many of you have seen my video on uh, IOTA scoring, ROMA, ROCA scoring. I don't know how many of you have seen that in which I've tried to uh, delineate these, these terms. I've tried to explain you what exactly is the meaning of IOTA. IOTA is done through ultrasound. What is ROMA, ROCA? They are done through uh, biochemical serum markers. And uh, uh, what is the latest um, scoring, guys? Can anybody say about uh, the ovarian carcinoma or let's say ovarian cyst? What is the latest uh, scoring? Okay, some of you are answering right now. Yes, good, 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 good. Very good. Sneha, Sanya, yes, yes, correct. RMI, no, not, not, not that one. Uh, RMI scoring is separate. Yes, it's also very, very important if you go through the RCOG guidelines, RMI scoring is the one, right? But the latest one is um, ORADS. I think I spoke with you regarding this couple of months back when I was doing, I think, ovarian carcinoma, yes. So ovarian cysts, now the latest is ORADS, in which the scoring is given in such a way that we can delineate whether this is a malignant lesion, borderline lesion, or a simple cyst or, or, or a benign cyst. We wouldn't call it a simple cyst, but a benign cyst, right? So yes, I am so proud of all my students. This is the power of collective learning. Very good. Very good. You're trying and you're maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong, but you're all trying. That's excellent. So the answer which I would want to give <clears throat> as a postgraduate student will be a CA125 with HE4 because HE4 now is being utilized uh, in uh, Roma and Roca tests, the serum uh, biochemical tests in which we try to uh, delineate the, uh, you know, ovarian malignancy, ovarian carcinoma. So we utilize uh, HE4. Transferrin, transthyretin, I'll have to see, Neelam, all right? I'll have to see whether that is there or not and whether it will be taken up in preference to CA125 or HE4 or not. But yes, definitely HE4 I would like to include. And... Um, CA125, everybody is expecting of you. But the second one, everybody wants to know. Let me tell you, when I was taking the, I took two uh, sessions, right, on uh, ovarian, uh, I would say, ovarian masses. One were those benign masses, benign and malignant, both in the, you know, this adolescent and child uh, age group. The ones in which I included the granulosa cell tumors, which includes the benign and malignant both. And then I included the, uh, cyst, ovarian cysts or ovarian masses in the adult group in which I included the benign cysts along with the malignant transformation of uh, going to ovarian carcinoma. In that, in the, the adolescent, adolescent age group or child um, age group, we spoke regarding the three important tumor markers which have to be done uh, to delineate uh, for any ovarian mass in that particular age. I think I did tell you about those uh, important tumor markers, right? So that is where I had included this uh, uh, AFP was there, beta HCG was there. No, we do not include uh, CA125. We include these important uh, tumor markers. We include AFP, LDH, we include beta HCG. All right. So these are important tumor markers which have to be done in any, you know, this adolescent age group because we are expecting granulos. We are expecting basically the germ cell tumors. Correct. So I wouldn't want that thing to be spoken here. That is what I want to say. Correct. All right. Enumerate any two factors that will affect the prognosis of the disease. Now, when you're talking about ovarian carcinoma, what factors affect the prognosis of this disease? That is what I want to know. All right. Let me hear this. Any two factors that affect the prognosis of this disease? What do we have here?
Yes, stage of the disease, very important. Yes, staging, grading, you can always say, right? So how how far this uh, disease is metastasized? What is this, you know, uh, grade of the tumor? Okay, so you have gradations as well. And and what else? Mm, okay, how much, how much? Very important, very important. I think I have not included this in my answer, but very important point. How much residual disease have you left after the after the surgery? Because every time whenever you have a variant carcinoma, unlike vulval carcinoma or unlike cervical carcinoma, we go in for a surgery, right? In cervical carcinoma, after a particular uh, stage, you do not go for uh, surgery, right? You go in for a chemo radiotherapy. But for a variant carcinoma, you go for a debulking surgery almost every day. Sometimes you give neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then go for a debulking surgery. Sometimes you just go for a debulking surgery and followed by uh chemotherapy but in case of uh you see ovary very important thing is how much residual disease has been left uh, after your particular debulking surgery which decides the prognosis yes so you can include that as well i will just include that because these uh, notes are going to be there for you for a long time all right so this is a very important prognostic factor correct so histology of the tumor is very important you know the clear cell tumors how they are or uh, uh, some uh, lethal, yeah, Krukenberg tumor which gets metastasized. All right, that's very, very lethal. You have another one which is mucus or mucinous uh, cell tumor. Serous is also bad, very bad, but it's got different grades. All right. So, but there are other much, uh, you know, fierce cancer. So, definitely histology is very important. What else have you answered? Let me see. Yes, yes, Mets do the note, uh, lymph nodes, definitely. You can. So you have lots of answers. It's not very, any hard and fast. You have multiple answers. You can give those answers. Uh, and uh, I would accept most of them, correct? So these are multiple, um, you know, what do I say, factors on which the, you know, this uh, prognosis depends. And most of you are right in all the answers. So now what's the most common root of spread of this pathology? This I would want to know. I remember teaching you this in my class. So. Yes, yes, it's a direct spread. It's a direct spread. That's the worst thing because you see the peritoneal deposits very fast, right? So it doesn't take much for the peritoneal spread and then the spread to the remaining uh, pelvic peritoneum and then abdominal uh, uh, peritoneal cavity, correct? Yes, so it's direct, correct. So here are the answers. You get the answers all you've already done before. Uh, let me just add, though there was only two, I'll just, um, I'll just add this uh, third point. That is, the residual disease is very, very important. I just didn't want this part to, residual disease. Correct. Now, <clears throat> this was station number two. <clears throat> Remember writing down your questions if you have any doubts. And we'll discuss it later. This is station number three, in which, uh, what do you see over here? Here, Let's see this, this is placenta. This is also placenta. Then what is this? What is this? And look at the hazy picture. I can hardly make out what exactly they're talking about over here. But then I, I thought first it's got some cord prolapse or something they're talking about, but cord is right here. Then this placenta here is also placenta. Then I understood this is succinctuate lobe. Either they're talking about succinctuate lobe or they're talking about this leash, which is very, very specific. What is that, guys? What is that? Let me see. Yes, excellent, guys. Do you need this class, huh? Do you really need this class? You already know the answers. This is Vaza Privia. Why do you call this Vaza Privia? What exactly is Vaza Privia? Can you, can you just tell me that? Because that's, okay, fine, that's okay. If you can just write down, this is Vaza Privia, fine. But, um, See, there are two types of vasa privia as well, but it's okay. That much is not needed for you. You can just tell me, just describe what you mean by vasa privia. Um, vasa privia. It's actually, okay, you keep answering, then I'll tell you the answer. You keep answering. The moment I get the right answer, I'll stop and I'll... Okay, vessels, fine, pa vessels passing over the cervix. Which vessels? Which vessels are they? Why is Vaza Privia such a catastrophic condition? Why even 100 ml passing of this blood outside is considered catastrophic for the baby? I want to know this. Okay, great, great. I think I, I already got these two answers are there, which is very, very good. It's 
excellent you got the answer it's actually guys now remember remember stop stop answering and listen to me carefully they are not umbilical vessels they are not placental vessels they are fetal blood fetal blood vessels which is very 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 important okay even 80 ml to 100 ml of blood loss by if it is a vasa previa condition is catastrophic for the for the baby the fetal heart will suddenly dip down and you'll have to rush to the for the emergency cesarean section and if she keeps if the patient keeps bleeding like this or the baby keeps bleeding like that by the time you take out the baby the baby might not survive because at a very early stage at the stage of this you know the fetal blood is in itself very less okay so the total body the total body might contain only some 400 500 ml of blood so even 100 ml is if it's lost the baby can have so many problems right so you have to be very very specific whether this blood loss is placental or is it fetal because just in case it's fetal before you take an action it's already too late or before you understand it's already too late so this is actually a leash of fetal blood vessels which are communicating this is a succinctureate lobe i how many of you do not know the succinctureate lobe please write down for the sake of everyone what exactly is a succinctureate lobe of the placenta tell me that <clears throat> tell me that you just put off it it's a re brief recapitulation for all of us since i'm already talking about it might as well just uh, make you guys remember recapitulate and quickly so so that we can go on jump on to the next because i have couple of slides coming up and i think i have some 10 12 sorry, slides to discuss tonight and then there is another class coming all right so all your doubts in this next coming week most welcome most welcome tonight <laughs> i was because of my uh, current um, uh, schedule uh, i was planning to take up a smaller class yes cotyledon mm, mm, mm. see it i'll not call it a cotyledon all right i will not call it it's a complete lobe it's a complete lobe of placenta all right uh, a complete lobe of placenta which is communicating with the placenta but not a part of it all right and how does it communicate because it's in the same membranes right when you when the when the um, placenta is delivered out and you see that one lobe is extra you see that the membranes are attached to it sometimes the fetal blood vessels traverse from this place to the other place so you can see that some a part the major placenta is lying here it's the one which is sending the umbilical cord to the fetus and then these membranes they are joining in with and this actually the placenta is finished till here right membranes keep go in they enclose the entire area the entire area in, till here both the place so when you whenever the placenta comes out the entire placenta comes out along with the succinctureate lobe and this succinctureate lobe very important very important for the ultrasound logist to inform the gynecologist that there is a succinctureate lobe sometimes the placenta gets delivered out this gets detached the, it's just a membrane okay they get just torn away and this stays inside and we have seen the placenta it's fine it's okay but the succinctureate lobe keeps you know it's either as attached or it doesn't come out and keeps causing bleeding 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 and some part of the placenta is still inside right so these uh, things should be informed <coughs> these anomalies not exactly uh, what do i say um, proper anomalies but these variations should be informed to the gynecologist this is a part of the ultrasound logist job anyways so this is now some part of fetal blood vessels are here so at the time the patient the baby or the uh, you know the the mother is having slight contractions even braxton hicks this can start bleeding and and we in that case we'll have to do everything in haste i'll be informing you teaching you this topic in the slides to come so don't worry let's jump on to the next question so this is a developmental anomaly of the placenta you can see it's called as succinctureate lobe which you all have correctly said what is the likely complication with which the patient might present so the patient is going to come up with bleeding fresh bleeding along with maybe a fetal heart derangement remember that so the moment the patient is bleeding and the fetal heart is also dipping down be very very super alert this could be a uh, vasa previa an undiagnosed vasa previa which is not very good uh fourth question what test is going to confirm the diagnosis that i'm going to tell you when i'll teach you about vasa previa and what will be the treatment again that will also be taught when uh, but i really want to know uh, how many of you know this uh, this answer what test is going to confirm the diagnosis the fourth question okay okay all right okay yes there is a diagnostic test all right uh, neelam geeta can you please explain can you just elaborate apt for all of us 
previous with Doppler is what I'm going to tell you next. Yes. Please elaborate a little about APT for all of us. And 10% uh, KOH with the okay, fine, fine. Uh, maybe your examiners would want to hear that. It's more of a theoretical benefit. Agreed, to, agreed towards it. Absolutely. Um, I'll tell you exactly what the diagnosis is going to be for uh, for vasa previa. Okay. If the blood if the blood is fetal, it's going to turn green. All right. So this is for everybody who uh, would want to uh, give this as one of the tests because the examiners, you know, they have a very nasty habit of asking you, what if there is no ultrasound? How would you want to confirm? What else? What else? This kind of question you can answer this. All right. So remember this, that there's a there's an APT test in which the diagnosis can be done at a very clinical level uh, at a very basic level that you might not need to involve another faculty in it you can do it yourself right and um, a very very basic test now what will be the treatment for this condition can anybody tell me that how will you you know manage a, pace, a patient who is having uh, vasa previa yes that's the answer an immediate cesarean section correct agreed absolutely so here I'm just uh, kind of uh, um, elaborating it again. I've just written it down for everybody to just quickly go through whenever they're doing it. So you just go through one to second, third, fourth, uh, you know, points in the PPT and they are there in your mind. So this is confirmed by something which is called as the color Doppler index, guys. Okay, this I want you all to know. This is according to the RCOGGTG. Nothing above that. All right. So I Vasa Privia, there is a complete GTG. Okay. The green top guidelines on uh, Vasa Privia. So very, very important. Remember, guys, one thing I'd like to tell you that if there is a green top guideline, there's nothing above that, at least in, 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 in RCOG, because that's only the recommendations which are based on lots and lots of randomized control trials, meta analysis, A++. Uh, grade evidence so there is nothing above that otherwise they do not use the recommendations they don't say anything about recommended they do not say anything until unless they are very very sure of that so when i say that this condition is confirmed through color doppler index that means and this is a gtg guideline remember that there's nothing above it this is the confirmatory test all right but if the question is asked about uh what else what how how can you do it in your labor room how uh, this is you know suppose the patient comes to you bleeding how well at that time you'll know you know without the without the ultrasound that this you can call you can talk about your apt test right what else the examiner have a habit of asking you and they would want to know this apt right okay now this is for all of you just to make you more well versed with uh, this uh vasa previa topic because I wanted you to know a um, little bit in detail regarding Vasa Privia. So here, what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to impress upon you the fact is that the speed with which the fetal exsanguination can occur, it's very, very mortal. So you have to be very, very uh, quick in deciding that this patient has to be taken up for immediate C-section. Otherwise, otherwise, see, administration of corticosteroids for fetal lung maturity should be recommended from 32 weeks of gestation you have to see what happens is that this uh, vasa previa condition is usually already predetermined in patients who have been uh, normal anc patients for you right from the very beginning okay in in uh, uh, nhs or in uk these pe these uh, people they keep uh, you know following up Unlike in our country, there's some patients, some patients are coming, uh, you know, at the time of delivery. Some patients are coming at the time of, uh, you know, maybe towards the last trimester and they have never followed up with you and they're coming with bleeding. Sometimes they're coming with bleeding. So in that case, how do you know exactly which kind of bleeding is that? And the moment the patient is having bleeding along with fetal heart derangement, you can have a hunch, but you do not know for sure. At that time, getting an ultrasound on how difficult is it in a poorly resourced country? You understand that. So what happens usually in, um, you know, in Western countries outside? They have been having these those normal ANC routine patients. This color Doppler index usually um, finds out by 20 weeks, 24 weeks, 30, 32 weeks that this patient is having Vasa Previa. So such a patient is usually admitted. I've written it over here. See, a decision for prophylactic hospitalization from 30 to 32 weeks of gestation women with confirmed Vasa Previa should be individualized and based on combination of factors, including multiple pregnancy, antenatal bleeding and threatened preterm labor should be given due care. Correct. So over here, when I'm saying administration of corticosteroids for fetal lung maturity, this should be recommended from 32 weeks of gestation because they have a very high risk 
of preterm delivery. So you have to take it seriously. This we finished station three, right?